Good morning and welcome, church. It's wonderful to be together again this Sunday morning. Steve invited me along, so I was thrilled. It's nice to hang out. It's nice to be in church. With well, people. Yeah, actually, yeah. literal live people. You know, it's wonderful. Wish you were here too. However, it's just wonderful to be together. I hope you've had a good week. It's been an interesting week for all sorts of reasons. And I just it's wonderful to have this opportunity to be together to worship this morning. Thanks, Kate. It has been an interesting week and a very busy week as well. It was one that started on Monday with a church members meeting. So thank you to everybody who was able to be there on that Zoom call on Monday evening. We went through, let's be honest, quite a lot of business. And there were things, we looked at the budget, we looked at our leadership structures and the way that we do leadership uh, within the church here. And we also gave an important update um, about the building development, which you can find on the website um, if you want to look at that further. But we also gave, I gave a very brief update on Peter and his family, and uh, we're obviously expecting them to join us later in the year. I gave an update on that, but actually I spoke to Peter in the week as well, and uh, we talked about how good it would be for him, just to give you a quick update as well. So here's Peter. So, the fine people of Newport Pagnell Baptist Church. Here I am in snowy Norfolk. Um, I don't know whether you've had much snow. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, just, well, I I think it's thank you. Um, But I and the family are really honored to be offered the role uh, that you've asked us to fill of uh, the associate minister with you. We're really looking forward to coming. there are some things that uh, are going frustratingly slowly at this end, um, like uh, sort of selling the house, which apparently is not very easy to do in COVID and uh, weather like this is not helping people coming around as well. So if you've got your praying hats on, uh, please pray for the right person to come through the doors and to buy our house here to allow us to move. Uh, But the other thing, I'm really excited about the possibility of doing a Bible study on Zoom with you guys. And I'm hoping that um, you will have received details about how to log into that Bible study. For my university course, I have been studying women of the Old Testament and particularly the book of Ruth, which is one of my personal favorites. I absolutely adore it as a book. So a short Bible study um, where I get the opportunity to share some of what I've learned with you guys. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, It'd be great if you um, had the time to dial in um, I'm going to ask for some feedback from some of you. It would be fantastic if you if you gave that. But to be honest, the main thing, I'd just love you to hear um, what I've been learning uh, about that particular book of the Old Testament and what it tells us about God. So thank you so much um, for offering us the, the position to come and work with you guys. We're super excited and I'm super excited as well to, um, to have that Bible study with you. Take care. God bless. And we, uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing you as soon as possible. Oh, that was wonderful to have an update from Peter and to actually see him again. We're really, really looking forward to having them with us. And wouldn't it be fantastic if as many of us as possible could join him on Thursday evening? That sounds like a fantastic opportunity for us to share with him and to just get to know him a bit more and just his heart for God. Um, So the Zoom stuff is all on the website. You know where to get those things now. We're all fairly used to it. But eight o'clock on Thursday evening, it follows straight on. It will follow straight on from the Thursday prayer at 7.30, the 30 minutes of prayer at 7.30. Can I encourage you, church, to join in with that on Thursday? I joined this Thursday. I have been frequently, but I haven't done for a few weeks. And I joined on Thursday this week. And it is just a really informal, wonderful opportunity to just not only save people from church yet again, I seem to crave that all the time anyway, but actually just to pray together, just to have that opportunity to pray for the people that are on our hearts, for our church, for our community, just in a really brief way, but just really meaningful. So I would really encourage you this week, if you could get a chance on Thursday, 7.30, that would be a great thing to do. It'd be lovely to see you there. And talking about being together, I love February. You get loads of different things going on in February. And I'm particularly excited about Tuesday. One of my favorite things, I'm very glad it's fallen during half term because it means as a mum and with a family, I'll actually have time to do some stuff rather than running around like crazy. But it's pancake day. 
And I always think that's a great opportunity as a church. Normally, we'd obviously be in here doing stuff together. Have we got anything planned? We have, Kate, we have. So like you say, pancakes are a big thing at this church. They have been for years and years and years. And uh, so this week we thought, well, we can't miss it completely. So we're going to have something called the Big Flip on Tuesday evening. So, I mean, it's got to be via Zoom, right? Okay, so, um, but what we're going to do, we're inviting people, when you're making pancakes in your own home, just if you can time it, so you're making pancakes around about quarter to six, you can come online at quarter to six or any time before six o'clock, And then at six o'clock, wherever we are as a church family in our homes, we're all going to flip together. It's going to be a moment of unity in flipping. Okay. And I mean, I don't know what we'll do after that. We'll eat our pancakes and we'll say goodbye, I expect. But it's just a bit of fun and a chance to be together. Perfect. I'm loving that. So everyone just needs their batter ready. Get your batter prepped and ready and your pan hot. Yeah. Other than that. And, and we, want it, we want it to be something the kids can be involved in yeah. too, children can be involved in too. So, or whole families can be involved in, anybody. Mass yeah. pancake flipping Absolutely. of Newport Packing. We might break a record, you know. Oh, I love that. Are there any records? <laughs> Funny you should <laughs> say that, Kate. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know, Kate, what do you think, okay? Right. So I read this this week. Yeah. What do you think the record is for the number of flips of a pancake in a minute? All right. <laughs> You were going it's probably quickly. quicker than that. I'm, I, a bit like surely. All right, I reckon even if you're going at a good rate, two a second. Okay. All right, two a second. Now do the maths. Yeah, I mean, literally. <laughs> that, I'm glad you came yeah. on that. You know, primary school teacher and all that. 120. There you go. 140. Okay. <laughs> I can't quite How can get. You do my... more than two a second. I, I cannot... thought that was pushing it. I know. I can't get my head around. And, and, and not dropping it, which is what I think would, would probably happen yeah, to Yeah, keeping well. going for a whole minute yeah. in itself. Yeah, anyway. Wowzers, love that. We have more of those for Tuesday evening. So. Oh, bring it on. And, and it's just about being together, Kate, essentially. Just I think, about being together. And I think that is just such a key thing. I've really been thinking this week. Um, at the church meeting, Steve played um, the Pat Barrett song, Build My Life. Build Your Life. Build My Life. Build My Life. By Build, Build My Life. Yeah. And... The words in that really struck me. It was, it talks about um, fill my heart and show me in your love other people. And I just, with Valentine's Day, it's just, we go on and on. I mean, I'm not a massive fan of Valentine's Day. Whatever you think about it, it's a big commercial thing nowadays. But it does make you think about love and the gift of love. And we talk a lot in church about the greatest gift of love being God's love for us in the way that he sent Jesus, his son, to die for us. And that that being his love for us. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that's not great. That is amazing. But the thing that's really struck me this week while I've been thinking about it is that actually, and especially at the moment, the other huge gift of love that God gives us is his love for other people. Because actually, I think even lockdown, I love my husband and my children, don't get me wrong. But there have been times where I've really needed God to give me his love for them as well, because not everybody, and I'm the same, I'm included, I'm glad that God's given them his love for me, (laughs) because quite honestly, let's face it, not everybody is lovable all the time. And actually, we really, that's still not an excuse not to show God's love, because he gives it to us so freely to give to other people. And that's really been on my heart this week. I love that, Kate. And partly because... uh, I think it's something that's been on my heart and others within the church family too. Um, Lockdown's just been so, so difficult. And we're coming up to a year, a year of not being together, right? In the way that we would want to be. And I've been really conscious in recent weeks that we, I feel like we've done lots of business. Yeah. So we've done, we've looked at things like the constitution and membership and, Uh, finances and some really important things in church life but actually I've really felt over these last few weeks God's been saying it's it's time to pause and just to stop and reflect on what really matters and so church family we're just beginning to work this out but from the start of March through to after Easter 
we're probably going to encourage people just to stop the busyness from a church perspective. We know you can't always stop it from a life perspective, um, only. if only, yeah. But we're going to encourage people to, to, to kind of put down some of the things they might be doing just so that we can focus on loving God and loving each other. And, and so there's going to be more coming on that. But if you've got, let that kind of soak into your heart and, and see where God le- leads you with it. Because, yeah, it could be something quite special. Yeah, absolutely. I think. And we want to focus a little bit on that as we start this morning. So we're going to spend a bit of time in worship. We're going to sing together. We're going to read from God's word together and pray together, focused on that subject of love. Let's do that now. going to share with you three short Bible readings, each taken from the different texts that we've looked at over the last three weeks, where Paul was talking about the gifts, but he rooted it all in love. 
Let me start with Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to read from verses 9 to 10. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, but cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. And I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. And mark that you do this with humility and discipline, not in fits and starts, but steadily, pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love, alert at noticing differences and quick at mending fences. And then 1 Corinthians 13, famous verses. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonour others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you not only for your incredible love for us, but Lord Jesus, we just thank you that you have shown us and that you have guided us and pointed us in the direction of how we should love other people. Lord, the Bible is just so full of these wonderful instructions of just what love is. And Father, I just pray that that is a reality in our lives this week. As we go through whatever it is we're doing in our day-to-day -day business, whatever it is, whoever we come into contact with, Father, I just pray that our hearts will be so full of your love that it will pour out of us, that it will just be shown to other people without them even realising that they will see that that is your love, Father God. I just pray that we will be mindful to, to show that to other people, that we will make a point, as it said in that passage in Ephesians, of being alert, being alert to those people, Father, that need your love. I just ask that, that we are so full this week of all that you have to give us that we can then give to others. In your holy and precious name, amen. You 
Steve, we've been following this Equip series and we've yeah. been looking at spiritual gifts and we've followed a few of the letters from Paul to the churches. But we're kind of at that point of what now? What next? What are we going to learn next? So uh, you're right. We've, we've uh, looked at Paul's letter to the Corinthians, to the Ephesians, to the Romans, each where he talks about gifts, but talks them out, about them in the context of something bigger, either worship or the way that we live our lives. And I know there would have been people, yeah, a bit like you saying, come on, what next? How do we, how do we use these? What do they mean in church life? And we are going to get to that. We are going to get to that. <laughs> However, we've got one other piece of kind of foundational truth that we're going to look at today that is so important to pause on, simply because anybody who's read up on gifts or been around churches where gifts have been used will know that most of the time they're just fantastic things given by God for us to use, but sometimes they cause controversy. Sometimes they can cause division in churches. And I just want to make sure before we dive in and say, okay, how do we use them and what are they, you know, get into a bit more of that, that we've rooted ourselves in that. So I'm sorry if that, if there are people at home today thinking, Oh, not another week of kind of foundational stuff. 
It's really important. And I know, I know, Kate, that there's richness in it and that God's got something to say this morning. Let's just pray about that now. Let's just really just take this opportunity. Father God, we just thank you so much that you are leading us as a church, that you are showing us what it is that you want us to be looking at, what it is that you want us to have a heart for in our church. And Father, I just pray for Steve as he speaks to us this morning, Lord. I just pray that you will just give him the words, that you will just really show us through him what it is about these gifts, what it is that we need to look at, what it is we need to be aware of. Father, I just pray that you have a real specific message for us this morning as a whole church as to how we need to focus our lives and focus our aims with regards to these spiritual gifts, Father God. We ask this in your name. Amen. So the reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting at verse 1. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge of prophecy or word of instruction? Even the case in the case of lifeless things that make sounds such as the pipe or harp, How will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you are praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer say amen to your thanksgiving, since they do not know what you are saying? You are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. In the law, it is written, with other tongues and through the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, but even they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues, then, are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophesy, however, is not for unbelievers, but for believers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and brought under judgment by all, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. So church family, that was quite a reading, right? There was loads in that to get our heads around. And I'm going to start by saying we're not going to get our heads around all of it because there's too much in there. In fact, as I prepared for this morning, one of the big things that stood out for me was that this is an area, particularly around speaking in tongues, that we're we're going to come back to. And we may well come back to it when we're back together as church, because I think it might be better for us to be in a room talking about it uh, than you just listening to one voice or us doing it via Zoom. But uh, if there was one thing that I could say that would summarize everything that we've heard 
over the last four weeks, it would be the first verse that Kate read to us earlier on. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Those two things together that Paul said. And so important are those words for us today that not only are they there on the screen, but I have a special red buzzer today. And every time I press this buzzer, buzzer we're going to hear these words. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Okay. So, and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Seek the love of God. We've been talking a bit about this this morning, which then enables you to show love to others. And building on that as your foundation, eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. In 21st century language, rather than saying eagerly desire, we might say, go after the gifts of the Spirit. And as we identified last week, these themes appear all across all of the letters that Paul writes, where he explicitly mentions gifts, which means if they're there in all of them, he must have been onto something. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. But although those words, and bearing in mind everything else that we know about God, Bearing in mind that that really seems sensible, kind of logical, kind of obvious, you might say, he must have put those words there for a reason. He must have repeated that emphasis for a reason. And I think that reason is because whenever spiritual gifts have been exercised, especially particular spiritual gifts, there appears to be controversy in the church. Controversy which create, creates division and challenges the diversity and the unity that Paul has already told us should define the body of Christ. So what is that controversy? Well, let me share um, just a few thoughts on that as we start. Well, firstly, I want to be clear to you, church family, there's no controversy in the gifts themselves. As we've already said in previous weeks, these are gifts of grace, grace gifts from God. They're divine gifts, which means they're of God. So they can't be packed with controversy or, or, or have any evil in them, anything bad in them at all. The challenge comes with the way that those gifts are interpreted or the way that those gifts are used, i.e. not in the divine bit, but in the human bit. The way we use the gifts raises questions. Which leads us to the second point of controversy, which is that spiritual gifts can be controversial because we struggle in our humanness to separate the gift from the one who demonstrates the gift. Think about Paul's words in a letter to another church, this time in Thessalonica, chapter 5, or the first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 19 to 22. The emphasis that Paul puts in there is on testing the prophecy, not the one that brings the prophecy. Thirdly, there's often controversy because, let's face it, supernatural stuff sits outside of our understanding. This is obviously more... More true of some gifts than of others, especially prophecy and speaking in tongues, the two that Paul speaks of in part of this letter. It's not to say here, and it's really important, it's not to say that every gift isn't spiritual. We diminish the gifts when we say that. However, some are more difficult, they're simply more difficult to understand than others are. Take the gift of tongues, which we're going to think about a bit today, over the gift of encouragement, for example. When it comes to the latter of those, there's simply, or, or sorry, when it comes to tongues, there's simply so much we don't know, which means more points of view, which means more interpretations, which means more room for disagreement and division 
and controversy. Which gets us to our fourth point. The use of spiritual gifts has traditionally been really divisive in church life. Sometimes with whole movements starting either in support of more use of the church gifts or a vote of particular gifts or movements starting that say we shouldn't use those gifts. So read these words and we have to assume that there was division or confusion in the church in Corinth simply because Paul felt he had to address it. So we could choose to say at this point, that we've made our mind up, that everything we already know about these gifts is all we need to know. Or we could actually choose another way, which is this. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. So let's explore. Come on, let's go beyond. Let's be prepared to go deeper. Because I believe that when we're prepared to step into that space, when we open our lives up to the Holy Spirit, that's when we encounter God and all that he wants to do in us and through us. I believe there's treasure to be found when we do that. Now, the challenge today, as I've already said, is to pack all of that in. Now, we're going to take a moment to understand more about these two gifts, prophecy and then tongues. And then we're going to unpack a particular or a specific area of controversy that Paul tackles. So let me give you some background on these two. So first off, prophecy. Now, a couple of weeks ago, you already heard our Open University lecturer summarise prophecy. If you don't know what I'm talking about there, you need to go back a couple of weeks and watch that. You you saw our Open University lecturer summarise prophecy as the gift of communicating revelations from God. Those revelations are not always ones that are concerned with telling the future, although that is one aspect of prophecy, but often are simply there to challenge the way that we might be living today or to say something about life today. Now, if you were to read through all of the Bible from start to finish, It would be difficult to come out at the other end thinking that prophecy wasn't a big deal. It is. It helped Moses to win the support of the Israelites and then humbled Pharaoh into setting them free. It brought David to the throne of the house of Israel. In fact, from the first prophet Abel through to the late prophet Zechariah, the Old Testament is a story about people who prophesied. And it didn't end there. In John 14, Jesus says to his disciples, the words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Remember how he knew the name of the tax collector who was sitting in the tree? Remember how Jesus knew the relationship status of the woman at the well. He didn't have to look on Facebook to find that out. He knew the relationship status of that woman. Think about how often he held the mirror up to the people of the day. And he told them what was to come if they chose not to follow him. And then, of course, he also spoke of continuing those very same prophecies, not through what he said, but through what people within his church would say, within what God's people might say, through the body. Matthew 10, verse 27, Jesus says, What I tell you in the dark when you're praying, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, speak it from the rooftops. It was also there as a promise when the Holy Spirit came in Acts 2, 17. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Peter and Philip and Paul would go on to see that come to fruition. And it's true in the church today too. Okay, so that gives a little bit of background on prophecy. So let's do something similar uh, with tongues. Now, this is one of those gifts when there is absolutely no doubting humanity. Uh, uh, There's no doubting our humanity. 
it's just plain strange, right? That somebody sitting in church one Sunday morning or anywhere might start speaking a language that they don't actually know, that they can't actually speak. Now, I know my wife Natasha is watching this thinking, I quite often don't know what Steve's on about, but this is different. There are broadly two manifestations, two ways that this gift is demonstrated, all of which originate, or both of which originate, from the same Greek word. Firstly, and I'm going to do my best to get this right, there's xenoglossolalia. I'm not saying that again. Zen, I am. Xenoglossolalia. The act of speaking a language that the speaker doesn't know but the other people who are present do know. Go back to Acts 2 and the coming of the Holy Spirit. That's, what go, that's what's going on there. People speaking in other languages that are not, not their own, but are understood by others who are there. There's heaps I could say about that, but I'm not going to go into now. We'll save that for another time. Secondly, there's glossolalia. The act of speaking a language that neither the speaker nor the hearer understands. Now, this is sometimes heard in worship, and it's more commonly referred to as what we would know as speaking in tongues. And let's be honest, if you've experienced it, it can be both beautiful and a little bit strange all at the same time. Now, when this happens in public, as the Bible has taught us this morning, as we've read it, there needs to be someone else there who can interpret. Not necessarily because they know the language, but because the Holy Spirit gives them the words to say, tells them what those words might mean, gives them an interpretation. Now, when that happens in private, there's no interpretation needed because it's just worship from the speaker giving those words, giving that praise and worship to God. But when it's done in public, it needs somebody to interpret it. Now, let me say straight away, if I was to ask for people's view on speaking in tongues in a church context, it would be very similar to standing before a question time audience and panel and asking them for their views on Brexit. Different people have different perspectives on this based on their own understanding of Scripture, based on their experiences and background, which is why Paul was so keen to remind them, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. I could say so much more on this, even on the definitions themselves, but I'm going to leave it there because today is more about dealing with the text and the potential controversies that it throws up. And we're going to look at one of those controversies now, which is this one. The idea that some gifts are greater than others. If you're anything like me, when I was in school and I was doing GCSEs, I am just about young enough to have done GCSEs. I read George Orwell's Animal Farm, which has in it one of those immortal lines, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. And when we read Paul's writing about gifts, it can sometimes feel that he might be saying something similar about spiritual gifts that they're all equal, but some are more equal than others. The good news is, I don't think that is what he's saying. Let me explain why. In this context, as Paul writes to the church in Corinth, particularly about prophecy and tongues, he can see a gift that is being misused or misunderstood. You see, in the early church, and in the church in Corinth, the gift of tongues was sometimes worn like a badge. For many people in the church there, speaking in tongues was perceived as an indication of God's special favour. So they over-egged its importance. 
They sought it too much. It became too important in itself. Okay, I get that, you're sitting saying. But why then, having gone on and on in all of the three texts that we've read over the last three weeks, that spiritual gifts are for everyone and they all play their part in the body and we're all equal, would Paul say in verse 5, the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues? Why would he say that? Back up, okay? It's time out, time to just step back a bit and ensure that we look at the whole picture. We already know that love has been foundational in Paul's teaching about gifts. Love that is foundational because it supports everything that gifts are about. Being used to build up the body of Christ. That's what they're for. Never for oneself, but for one another, for the church family, for the wider community. In the church in Corinth, though, people are wearing their speaking in tongues badges. But because no one understands them, or as Paul puts it, they utter mysteries of the spirit. The only person that they're serving as they speak those words is themselves. The only person that they're building up is themselves in their relationship with God. Contrast that with prophecy, which is outlined here as being something that strengthens and encourages and comforts. We see that as being for everyone else. Only then do we get to verse five, where we have to read beyond Paul's ver those, that initial phrase that Paul uses, where he says, the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. We have to read beyond because otherwise we miss Paul saying, unless. Unless someone interprets so that the church family understands and can be built up. So the definition of a gift that is greater than another gift only makes sense when a gift is not being used in the way that it was intended to be used. Let me say that again. The definition of a gift that is greater than another gift only makes sense when a gift is not being used in the way that it was intended to be used. So what this tells us, church family, is don't stop dis desiring the gifts, but desire them because of what they'll bring to the whole church family. In other words... Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Paul says loads more here about how the gifts of tongues should be used. And as I've said, we're going to come back to that at another time. But for now, I, I, want, to, I want to be transparent. Because I don't want to pretend that spiritual gifts don't come with all the baggage that we've covered today and more. Paul is clear that one should only speak in tongues publicly if there's someone else there to interpret. But you might find yourself asking the question, well, hang on a minute. If I'm prompted to pray in tongues somewhere that is public, how do I know if there's someone else there who can interpret? Paul speaks in this passage of order in worship when the spiritual gifts are being exercised. Well, how much order? How do we know what's of the spirit and orderly and what's not? Paul says, I would like all of you to speak in tongues. Does that mean we should all be able to? Because in verses we've read earlier in 1 Corinthians, he seems to suggest that not everyone can. I don't know, with all this controversy, don't you just think it would be easier if we just put those gifts away, especially the more challenging ones? Let's just put them to one side and forget all about them. There's a temptation in that. Although that doesn't work either, right? Why? Because... Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Church family, wouldn't it be brilliant if we could really go after all the spiritual gifts that God has given us 
and simultaneously guarantee that we never fall into the traps that the early church in Corinth or Ephesus or Rome might have done. Unfortunately, I suspect we have the potential to be more like them than we might want to admit to. Which is why that phrase that you've heard oh so many times this morning isn't only written at the start of chapter 14, but is written in a slightly different way at the end of chapter 12 as well. There Paul says, strive for the greater gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. At which point he goes on to read those verses from verse 13 about what love is. The ones that we read earlier this morning. Why? Because the two are inseparable. Inseparable. Gifts and love. We're called to go after the gifts. So come on, let's do it. And we're called to do it with God's love flowing through us. So let's do that as well. It doesn't mean that we'll always get it right. It doesn't mean that it will always be easy. But they're the ingredients that Paul is laying out for us. The ones that he wants us to follow. And if you're still worried... I want you to know, church family, this morning that it is absolutely possible to hold those two things together. To have controversy at times, but to be able to approach it with love. And I know that's possible because I experienced it. We experienced it as a church family on Monday evening. At a meeting that had the potential to be divisive. Or the potential for voices not to be heard. And in that moment, we sought God together as a church family and we found him. And the love and the grace that was demonstrated by God's people, by this church family in the process, was incredible. Now, if we can take that kind of love, And we can place it in equal measure alongside our desire for the gifts. I believe the Holy Spirit will do incredible things in us and through us in this church family. May we know both our unity and our diversity and hold the two together. May we follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. Amen. In the Saviour's love I find joy beyond compare Endless peace covers all of me when you breathe within you turn winter into spring grace dissolves every fear in me your love brings me to my knees brings me to my knees my king forever you are all my heart desires till the end of time my soul surrenders my vacant heart Lord you came and made a home you bring light to the dark in me when I lose my way I am 
beckoned into grace. You alone are my everything. Your love brings me to my knees, brings me to my knees. My King forever, you are all my heart desires till the end of time. My soul surrendered. the earth sing of mercy never ending I will worship with all that is within me holy holy Lord God almighty King of heaven yours is the glory all the earth sing of mercy never ending. I will worship with all that is within me. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, King of heaven, yours is the glory. to my knees brings me to my knees my king forever you are all my heart desires till the end of time my soul surrender your Brings me to my knees, brings me to my knees, my King forever. You are all my heart desire till the end of time. My soul surrendered. Let's pray together. Father God, we just thank you that as a church family, we are able to study your word and to, and to just accept the gifts that you have given us. Lord, I just pray that not only would we um, follow in the way of love and eagerly seek these gifts of the Spirit personally, but also, Father, as a church. I just pray that as a church community, as a church family, this is something that sets us out, that really is something that we seek as a group, Father God, that everything we do is centered around this principle, Lord, that we would just especially follow in this way of love. Lord, as we go into this week with all the different things that we have going on, I just pray that that message remains in our hearts and is something that we choose to focus on. Father, we just pray this week for all the different activities, for families finally taking a break over half term from homeschooling and from all the different things. And Lord, we also just remember the different activities in our church. We remember the, the big flip on Tuesday, Father, but we also just think about um, the service for Andrew House, Father. We just pray for Cynthia and the family that there will just be a real outpouring of your love for them in that. And Lord, I just pray that you will lay on our hearts the people that we know that we need to show your love to this week. We ask that in your holy and precious name, Father God. Amen. 
So Church, have a fantastic week. I really hope to see you all at the big flip on Tuesday with your pancakes ready. And then on Thursday, hopefully, if you can join us for the prayer meeting at half past seven and then for the Bible study with Peter Young at eight o'clock. Be great to see you. Have a wonderful week. Take care.